प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर भावेश कुमार चौहान सर डायरेक्टर बीबीडी एनआईटीएम लखनऊ प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर संजय कुमार डायरेक्टर डॉक्टर ए डी न्यू डेली द एडवाइजरी कमिटी फॉर द प्रोग्राम इंक्लूड्स मिस्टर विनय कुमार यादव सर मिस स्वाति खन्ना मैम मिस्टर असीम सहोरे सर The organizing committee includes Dr. Shivangi Tiwari, ma'am, Ms. Priyanka Singh, ma'am, and the co-coordinators are Ms. Pooja Garg, ma'am, and Ms. Twinkal Arora, ma'am. The topic for today's session is embracing online education and not fitting and not retrofitting. And on this note, I would like to welcome our esteemed guest for today's session, Mr. Kausav Mazumdar, sir, who is a strategist, assessor, a trainer, and takes interest in people. learning branding digital media data science and entrepreneurship he has done his loan masters from london business school psychometrics from university of cambridge and computer science engineering from university of southampton his current engagements in academia includes his work with the incubation and entrepreneurship initiative at sp jain institute of management and research mumbai and i am calcutta mentoring and advisory roles in an NSHM College Kolkata and a few other institutions across the country. Mazumdar sir has 24 years of experience out of which 22 as an entrepreneur. He has been involved in different businesses in various countries like India, UK, US, Ireland, Russia, Singapore and Bangladesh. He is the CEO of ILS Network and a part of various organizations such as Data Science Foundation, T5, Sandhu Solutions Y East and few others which operate on a global level and holds the position such as director CEO mentor and advisor in these organization he also has varied interest in fields like behavioral skills digital strategies customer engagement team building and entrepreneurship he and his team have worked with some of the biggest name in the world of business and governance across india and abroad he has served information technology giants leading construction and infrastructure companies steel and power majors garment and fashion accessory businesses healthcare and banking luminaries and education service providers and institutions his clients include ibm tcs cognizant wipro reliance tata steel goldman sachs and many more not only this he also coaches young minds and at times not so young ones as well in dealing with pressure accepting embracing and benefiting from change and strengthening overall thinking abilities his personal interest include writing and one of his stories has been recently made into a movie and is streaming on z5 he has worked with well over 40000 learners spanning industries and educational institutes in the area of technology business and developmental skills he has been he has spoken in numerous conferences and has been a facilitator and trainer in more than 300 professional workshops there is still so much to tell about sir but due to time constraints i would stop myself here and welcome sir mr kosam mazumdar sir i am honored to welcome you in our faculty development program and i would request you sir to please proceed with the program over to you sir thank you very much uh, good morning good morning everybody i hope i am audible yes sir you are perfectly audible yes sir very much sir thank you mr um every introduction of this nature is usually um quite embarrassing if you ask me uh, especially more so in this um, weird ways now that we are doing our conferences this conference was not meant to be like this right this conference was meant to be in person this conference was meant to be where i can see there are 172 of us are present today and we should have seen each other But these are strange times that we live in, and and you know, human. I think mankind, since the since the beginning of time, has always been able to adapt, and we are adapting. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this one little point before I carry on, Dr. Tiwari. There are a number of people who are trying to come in. Um, is there somebody who can manage this? Thank you. Yes, sir. We are managing. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Thank you, Dr. Tiwari. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, thank you, Professor Yadav. Thank you, Dr. Chauhan, and, and all the other seniors, colleagues, and friends present today. Um, I'm honored to be here with you. I think it's it's, it's a wonderful initiative that you guys have taken. Um, there are a number of uh, sessions, webinars, seminars. Well, they're all called webinars nowadays, taking place across the country. 
Um, but I, I, I would like to believe this would be one of the more important ones that's happening. Um, and over the next four, four days or five days, as I've been given to understand, is because this is a very, um, if I can use the word, alien world that we are stepping into. Um, I suspect most people present today are educators, are teachers, they could be some students. Um, this is not what we had signed up. This is not what we thought is going to be the norm uh, when we decided that we are going to become educators. Unlike many of you, I um, I am not uh, a full-fledged professor. I am not a full-fledged academic. That makes me very uh, worried and cautious, especially when I'm talking to people such as you. You have dedicated your entire life uh, in the service of students. Um, I am sort of in the peripheries. I'm more like a satellite. I have been teaching for the last 15, 20 years. Um, I've, I've done many different things in my life. I still do many different things. Um, the one thing that has given me the most joy, um, and I'm deeply grateful for the opportunities that I've had over time, is my time with students. I'm not a classical academic, so if I end up saying something today which offends anybody over here, please pardon me and please treat it as ignorance. I do not mean uh, any disrespect to anybody over here. Um, but possibly because I'm more, I lean more towards the side of the industry, um, my views may be slightly different um, as compared to many other traditional views. And some of my opinions may appear to be uh, slightly brusque, if I may say so. I have a presentation that I would like to share with you. Um, Dr. Tiwari, I have re had requested for a few polls. I don't know whether the polls were- Yes, sir. Okay. Polls are ready, Yes, sir. we have them ready. Okay, so whenever in the course of the presentation, you will see poll one, if you can then do poll one, and it'll, it'll, it'll come over there. Please put poll one and please put poll two, etc. And there are five of them in total. Um, there are quite a few slides. Um, I do not, one of the big changes that I've had to do in my life um, is, is adapt, adopt uh, and adapt to Microsoft PowerPoint. I detest PowerPoint. I have never liked uh, Microsoft PowerPoint. I think it is impersonal. I have always thought it to be impersonal. I'm the guy who would uh, go to a whiteboard or a blackboard and take a pen and start writing things. And, and I'll spend time with the learners try, trying to learn at the same time as them. But all of a sudden, you know, we have had to change all our ways. And here I am with a pretty large PowerPoint that I'm going to share with you. I'm going to go quickly. I hope to have, I hope to finish um, about 15, 20 minutes before time. Um, and I will be more than happy to take questions, as many as I can. Uh, Dr. Tiwari and Dr. Singh have my contact details. Um, those of you who would like to take the conversation offline, I'll be more than happy to do so. Um, without any further delay, I'm going to move towards my presentation. Uh, before I begin, uh, Dr. Chauhan said something very interesting. A lot of what we are doing today is because of the paradigm shift that we are experiencing. I think it's a very, very important uh, expression that he used, and I think I'm going to refer to this continuously. I'm going to try and share my screen. Please let me know if you can see this. Yes, yes sir, visible. All right. Um, the title of uh, the title of my presentation, while you know the wonderful things were said about what I'm going to be talking about, uh, it's actually not teaching online. I am not an expert of teaching online. Just like all of you, I suspect I am also trying to find out how to teach effectively online. Um, and it's too early. It's it's very early days to to pass judgments on the most effective ways of doing it. There are experts. Um, I take like I do these talks, I attend many talks and I'm attending a number of classes now to learn how to teach online. This is a new world for me. So this presentation in many ways is a conversation that I had with myself 
and my uh, problems and my shortcomings. I've tried to address them and I hope uh, some of them will resonate with some of you. First things first, COVID-19 is here and I'm going to die. Um, you know, uh, before we carry on with anything else, we need to understand ground zero uh, as clearly as possible. It is the big elephant in the room, which essentially means that you cannot avoid what is happening. This is, I mean, in, in our lifetimes, this is the largest, single largest incident that has literally brought the whole world together in a very weird way where it has impacted every single one of us. Um, and it is going to impact us more in the future. Big question that everybody's asking, my wife is a doctor, uh, and I ask her, how long is this going to last? The truth is that nobody knows. The other truth is that it's possibly going to last us for a pretty long time. in the last two weeks, I suspect it's more. Every industry is going to be hit. Life will not be what it used to be before. Everything is changing around us. But do you know what else is changing? Along with all that, At least, and I suspect for many of you, teaching could be for many of you a full-time employment. For me, it's not really my primary vocation, but I end up spending a significant part of my time in classrooms. Not because it fetches me money, it's simply because I love it. I, this is something I, I have must change along with those empty classrooms. The way we teach is what needs to change. The way we have been teaching is more or less the same. Ken Robinson and what it needs to go through, the changes that it needs to go through for the last 20 years, not the last two, three months, the last 20 years. I have tried to imbibe some of what he has been talking about, but in all fairness, yes, I don't think I really imbibe to imbibe change because I don't have any other option now. I have a small video. Some of you might have seen this. If you have, please bear with me. It's a, a minute and a half, roughly. This gentleman is, a, is, a, is an educator. Is a... Professor of some sort of the body. Please let me know if the audio is clear or not once I start. You are perfectly audible. Nice. I feel well. Managing to avoid the coronavirus. Oh, I'm happily retired now, but I imagine most of you guys will be working from home. You must resort to Zoom or FaceTime or Skype for your video conferences. Well,
Um, but um, one thing I quickly realized, I found the video very funny. Zoom's become so important to all of us. All of us are now the other tools like Zoom. One thing became very clear to me. You know what I was trying to do in the first lockdown? I knew I'm a man of science. Let's continue what I was doing before the lockdown started. I made little minor little adjustments to what I had before. And I was just trying to lead life the way it was. The difference being that my life was now being led on Zoom. But it was like notes where a few PowerPoint presentations, I had some, I made some more. I quickly did some videos. And instead of going and doing my classes in the classroom, I started doing classrooms like here. And I thought, okay, that's the way it's going to be. I saw this video and it set me thinking. We think. But I think it's time that we go back to the learning boards ourselves. But teaching online is the new norm. And a little bit of a history over here. We played with this for many years. Many of us think that this really started two months back or maybe five years back or eight years back or 10 years back. I did my computer science in the early to mid nineties. I, my, I mean, I had email before many other people did. 1992 or one, I had my email ID. I couldn't send any email to anybody else because nobody else had email IDs. In fact, my Hotmail email ID is costlove at hotmail.com. That's how old I am. Online education started around the 90s. Is that what we think? It started with our ill-fated affair with distance learning. Why ill-fated? Well, there's an exciting timeline which I would like to share with you guys. This is another experiment, Dr. Tiwari. I hope this works. I'm going to press on this link and it should open a browser window. And if it doesn't, please tell me if you can still see whatever I'm showing right now. Sure, sir. Can you see? No, sir. Right now, not visible. Okay. It, it was visible. It was visible. I, mean, I could see that. So you could see. Okay. No worries. Can you see this? Yes. No, yes, yeah, yes. It is, now it's it is visible. Yes, it's now visible. it is visible, sir. Excellent. I chanced upon this, and I, I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Singh and Dr. Tiwari because I chanced upon this. I wouldn't have looked for it. I looked for it because of this workshop. I was trying to figure out when did it all start. The first private correspondence course started in 1728. The whole concept of distance learning happened is because people could not come to classrooms, which is what it is now. 1873, look at the timeline. University of Chicago started the first correspondence course. 1906, Pennsylvania State College broadcasted its course for the first time in 1922. And I'm so grateful to both of you, Dr. Tiwari and Dr. Singh. These timelines are absolutely fantastic. State University of Iowa, five radio courses for credit. 1953, first televised college credit classes. 
and then the timeline went on. 65 was the first time they started doing something for doctors. Internet is founded in 1969, ARPANET. And look at the timelines. It's fascinating. I find it fascinating. Most of these timelines are before me. I mean, of course, 1981, 82, I was around, but I was a little boy. Um, and I was thinking all of this started two months back. I'm sorry, no, it didn't. All of this started a long time. No, I mean, if you start thinking the online education thing started, here you are. Virtual summer school for Open University, 1994. I was a student back then, an engineering student. First web-based university, 1996. I had no clue. Well, United States has got many problems in the way they are, and they're obviously suffering from many of their problems now. But they're also pioneers in many things. They've been pioneers with this for a very long period of time. I wasn't a part of this. India wasn't a part of this, of course. And it went on. YouTube, 2005. Khan Academy, 2006. Apple started in 2000 and 2009, YouTube Edu, the first MOOC, 2012 by Udacity. Many of you would know, but edX, 2012, etc. Go back to my presentation. I say ill-fated is because it's been around for a long time, ill-fated for not for distance education, ill-fated for people like me. I did not acknowledge its existence. There is this cynicism that many of us shared in the past. I certainly did, and I'm guilty. That anything distance, anything online, is possibly not as good as a real thing. The belief was that it's not the real thing. Of course, I did not know about coronavirus. I did not know that a time will come when this will become the real thing. And going back to the classroom will become a wish. It's ill-fated because it was targeted not just for people who did not have access to formal classroom education. It was targeted for every educator to understand that this is what the future is going to be. Right, moving on. Big questions. I recently read a brilliant article by an IIT professor chemical engineering prof professor IIT Mumbai came out on NDTV and I'm sure it's there in other uh, channels. Pretty, pretty uh, strongly worded um, article that gentleman has written about his frustrations of teaching online. When I read it, I agreed with every bit of it. But you know what? <clears throat> what do you do with those frustrations? Um, nothing really. So here it is. My first poll, Dr. Tiwari, Dr. Singh, if you could please swing the yes, first. Yes, sir. So just spare us few seconds. Sure. Gentlemen, ladies, my friends, colleagues, my seniors, if you could kindly select.
what a marvel technology is dr dr tiwari dr singh it's amazing i've never done this or i don't know whether you've done it before or not i've never done this before thank you so much sir we can run it till 1 minute 30 seconds and then we can stop it so when we think about online teaching problems there could be more problems than this these four stood out from various surveys you can stop the poll now thank you right so it's interesting as we see this um where well, internet bandwidth issue is a challenge and we really cannot do much about it we can do some right we can plan things slightly differently keeping the internet bandwidth in mind but really that's not something which is entirely in our hands the other three are I'm going to quickly move on. I think they are all valid reasons. Only ten percent of you felt that standing in front of the camera, you're not conscious of the camera. Ten percent of you felt. I don't know. Eight percent. I don't know. I am. i have done hundreds and hundreds of workshops i have been filmed many times still bothers me when there's a camera in front of me i don't know whether to look at you whether to look at myself or whether to look at the camera so this does not come naturally to me if it comes naturally to you guys good for you we like to you know have a discipline is crucial we like to maintain discipline and we have no clue how to do that when we're teaching online we do not know whether people are at all listening to us or not right now on my screen i can see myself and then there are four more uh, windows open obviously the videos are switched off for bandwidth issues etc how are we going to do it imagine there was no bandwidth issue imagine there are 60 people in the classroom and all 60 have kept their videos on all those windows are going to be this size how are we going to watch everybody how would we know if they're paying attention or not you know many of you would agree when we walk into a class and we start teaching we look at students we look at their body language we look at their faces we look at their eyes and as they say eyes are the are the window to your soul we know especially the people with experience we, we would know we would know whether we are having a good class or not whether we have their attention or not. so they're all important they're all important big question is how do we know whether they're learning or not you know covid-19 is happening right so we need to move forward there's no point thinking about these problems every time i speak to educators in various colleges my job is such that i i'm, I'm i spend a lot of my time with various institutions of yours people are continuously telling me about these problems and i tell them you know what we need to move on you cannot solve the internet bandwidth issue you need to move on can we have the poll too please yes sir yes sir yeah on it yes we'll keep the poll on for 1 minute this time how did we know that they are at all learning to choose as many as you want you could tell looking at their faces class participation 
voluntary class engagements which is often involuntary case studies quizzes or we call out students quick tests very popular with a lot of people post class discussions many professors um who would be fortunate i consider myself fortunate if my students reach out to me and say you know what i need to discuss this a little bit more i i need help it's such an important part as well and then of course you have exams isn't that what exams are meant to be to tell us how much they have learned thank you quick tests seem to be the most popular class engagements seem to be very very popular we could tell looking at their faces um it's not entirely scientific but it's true for a lot of us and with experience we learn but then you could be wrong class participation voluntary is popular as well post class discussions is something that is also seems to be very popular exams are there i want you to remember these polls and these remember these responses that you are giving cuz i'm going to refer back to these towards the end of the class how did we know that they are learning all of the above again as we saw some more important than others can we quickly have our poll three now please yes, yes sir so what is the biggest problem of online teaching please choose only one option this time and we will have our own personal choices on this right so a lot, a lot of the majority does not necessarily mean that majority is always correct over here because at the end of the day teaching is a very personal experience it's a very personal thing so it's how we teach so for you something may be slightly more important than other we we'll let the poll carry on it's interesting right how do we know that they're not getting distracted there's something called the goldfish syndrome which is usually 8 seconds i struggle to stay concentrated when i am attending webinars myself yet we expect our students to stay attentive when we are teaching them something which possibly they do not really want to learn oops the charm of the classroom is missing i find that a very interesting point classroom has its own charm I agree with you. It's very difficult to emulate. Them. How do we do peer learning? A lot of students learn from each other. They ask each other. I'm surprised to see it's at 10%. I would have thought that would be more because if you ask students, I suspect they're going to put more points over there. We have to update our technology prowess 23%. for a lot of you definitely for me despite my computer science background my daughter who's 8 i think knows how to use the ipad better than i do so many one of many of us feel we know technology we possibly don't and the final point we have to know our subject very well that's a very annoying point don't we already know our subject very well well there's something else in parenthesis over here in modern parlance that's a very important point in that for us to recognize when we teach supply chain management i wonder the frenzy that one experiences in a swiggy or a zomato if that would be the same in a traditional manufacturing industry i wonder 
when we are teaching e-commerce, a bot AI enabled e-commerce engine and the way that works say on Amazon, how different that is going to be from your college's website. Modern parlance is a very important point over there. Educators continuously try to stay updated. Well, we hope so. That's changing very rapidly. I'm going to carry on. I said we have to update. Well, there were five options. I said to choose one option. I believe it is extremely hard to choose any one. They're all important. All of them. So how did we know they're learning and the problems of online teaching? So we had these questions in front of us, these points. All of the above are relevant, all of them. On the left-hand side is how did we know that they are learning, the right-hand side problems of online teaching, all of them are relevant for us. But the problem is, <clears throat> now all of them are under threat. In this new mode of teaching, via online, all of them are under threat, unless we improvise, unless we innovate, unless we figure out ways and means of doing this differently. If we try and do the way we were doing before, just by using PowerPoint and Zoom, retrofitting, it's not going to work and it's going to give us, create an existential threat. It is our existential threat. Ernst and Young, one of the big fours, announced in Detroit that they will experiment taking people in entry-level jobs without graduation. Second existential threat, Elon Musk. Well, he's not really a poster boy of, as of an entrepreneur, but he's super smart. He went on record saying that he does not really care whether you have a degree or not. I am taking it to the complete other level. Have you guys considered of a time when students will question the relevance of degrees. NASCOM has been releasing year after year reports how employable are our engineers, how much really our management students learn. That need not be all our fault. I'm not saying that. But education has been going through this for a long time. I'm saying, I'm arguing with online, it is now staring at our face, but it was always the case in the last 10, 15, 20 years. We felt we could tell looking at their faces, maybe we were not right. Class participation, voluntary, does it always work? Or maybe some students tend to participate more than the others. And I think you would agree with that. Case studies. Well, in most business schools, I do not know about your school, but in most business schools in India and abroad, including the really big ones like the Harvards and the London Business Schools of the world, they still teach case studies which were written in 1950. I'm not saying they're not bad case studies, a lot to learn from the past. But most case studies are so old that they're irrelevant. Significant number of case studies are so big, the students actually don't read them. You think they read them. They online, they Google it. Quizzes could be fun. Quick tests. Many of you chose that option, I agree. Quick reviews, quick tests could be a good way of checking. Post-class discussions, always important. Exams. Well, we're going to discuss exams later. You know, we have to update our technology prowess. How do we do peer learning? Those are problems of online teaching. We need, to, we need to address each one of them. And if you do not address all of these, we are in trouble. Can you imagine, say five years from now, if your enrollment numbers go down further, if a whole bunch of Elon Musk say that I don't need people to go to college at all, please go to Udacity, 
please go to YouTube, please go to Khan Academy, learn what you need to learn, come to me. You don't need to learn computer science engineering, just learn Python and come to me. Just quickly learn data science somewhere, bit of economics, bit of statistics, bit of mathematics, a little bit of R programming, come to me, that should suffice. Can you imagine? I'm not saying that is ideal. I'm not saying that will be good, but can it not happen? And if you feel it will never happen, education will always be important. I would like to remind you, education as you see, it is only about two, 300 years old. It's not that it has been around forever. Most of us, I suspect all of us, four months back never thought that we're going to do a conference on Zoom. So anything's possible. So back to basics. I think it's time that we revisit our basics a little bit. What was learning all about? It's acquiring new understanding, knowledge, behavior, skills, values, attitude, preferences. You know, even when I decided or when I first realized that I want to, I was not really a very good student or anything like that. I was an average to above average student. I think I became a better student during my engineering days. I had a professor called Ken Thomas. My programming marks were always very low because I found programming very boring. I could not understand those of you from the computer science background this is pre C++ days, C days. I could not understand the, I, I found it very stupid, if pardon me from using a word like that, that you would write your lines of code and you don't put a semicolon and the damn thing will not work. And I felt, this is silly. I didn't enjoy programming. My marks had gone down and I needed to lift my marks up. I used to study in a university called Southampton, the city called Southampton in England. But who to me desi? Jugar is very, very common to people like us. So what do I do? I go to the number to my number. So what do I do? The only subject that I properly studied all my life was maths. We had maths called discrete maths, but I was done with it. I needed more maths so that I can lift my numbers. I enrolled myself for a subject called scientific computation. And a professor called Ken Thomas used to teach us. I would attend his classes. It was all calculus and you know, stuff, stuff that I'd done in my class 11 and 12. I grew up abroad, but I studied in Kendriya Vidyalaya. I, used to, I grew up in Moscow, in Russia. There's a Kendriya Vidyalaya there. So obviously, like most Indian students, I knew how to do all of that. And when the exam time came, I got everything correct and he gave me 60 or something out of 100. I was offended. I went and challenged him. I said, there is nothing wrong in my exam paper. How have you given me 60 and not 100 or 95 or whatever? Because all my plan of raising my mom had fallen down. He looked at me and he said, Kosta, the country that you come from, India, there are millions and millions of students just like you. Don't think you are good in maths. I later on realized that he actually knew a lot more about India than I Hold on a second. I need to go back to the basics. And we need to ask ourselves.
artists doing. In recently, in one of the colleges I go to, I had recommended that not just students but professors should also go for internships. I was it was not very well taken by many of the professors, but some agreed because we are far away from the world, the real world outside. In the classroom. We could force, and it need not be only their fault, it could very well be our fault as well. Can we have poll four, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In just a few seconds. Seconds. Thanks. Thanks. Somebody raised a hand, Nikita Mishra. If there are questions, it will be great if I can take them later on. If you can just write your question down, I'll be happy to take them. I don't know whether I'll be able to answer or not, but I'll certainly like to take them. Later. So you working I have no clue what you're doing and how you're doing. I'm just grateful you're doing it for me. Thank you. I mean, you cannot deny that. We've done good stuff, but we've had problems. So where students not interested, where our, our materials not adequate, we could not engage them properly. Maybe we needed to improve our teaching style, methodology. We're not updated enough with changing trends. Ah, thank you. Well done. We did not understand them well enough. Them is students over here. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. Thank you, everybody, for being so, so candid. Appreciate it. These polls are not easy. It takes major courage to face what's staring at our face. One minute, 30 seconds, you can stop the poll. If you are able to retain these polls, We're not updated enough with changing tra trends. That's 30%, one third.
It's amazing. Four of you, and six of you have said we did not understand them well enough. Hats off to you guys. But 53 of you said it's all of the above. I would tend to agree with that last one. A little something about our past. A significant number of us would agree. Educators in part of our learning is parroting. Rote learning is the essence of teaching still. It works up to a point when you're a little baby. And after some time, it stops being effective. But strangely, it not only persists throughout, I have no clue where that blue thing came from. I think it's one of the hosts. I can just get rid of that blue mark. Let us look within a bit. Dr. Tiwari, if somebody can get rid of that blue thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are removing and after. Okay, no worries. Just do it. Side of us. So, were there no problems with it? They see how the industry around us has changed. Did we do any one of these? We possibly did all of these, but only up to a point. I am inviting this August body over here to imbibe these questions. Ask yourself these questions. I don't need the answers. You know the answers, and we need to work on them individually, each one of us, and collectively. Which is what I think, which is why I think this program is so important. Over the course of the next few days, some of these questions are they're going to try and answer. Poll five. I hope you're ready with poll five. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All our teachers, the school does not really matter whether you're a teacher in a college or not. We all are teachers in some ways or the other. We're all learners as well in some ways or the other. So all of this is true for all of us in every walk of life. So if you are working in the accounts department, in the college and if you're the boss so it's not just educators and professors only it's true for every single one of us many of you have children it's true for you very interesting very very interesting remarkable remarkable thank you so much for your candid And to understand how millennials think. I find that fascinating. We tend to believe we can understand them. We, we understand the way they are and the world that they live in. Do we? Possibly not. And 47 of you, that is 37% felt that we need to change ourselves. That's so... Remarkable. You know, looking at it, we're changing ourselves, I think, in many ways. It encompasses everything, but it's all of them. Fabulous. Let's stop. We have to stop and rethink everything. 
everything has had innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, everything has had innovation. Education, barring education. We want education to be the way it was before. We want to teach the way we learned. We want the good old days. You know, kids nowadays are tired of hearing good old days ka story. It's their day now. And they is the question. As you know, planet Earth is closed for repairs right now. The world of education isn't. So before we carry on, there's one or two important sociological, psychological. The aspects that we need to think about the well-being. Um, and the choice and, and the fact that you can choose is critical to freedom and autonomy. I, I know it's a bit of a tongue twister, but it's important for us to understand this. It's true for every one of us. If we feel that we don't have autonomy. It's true for all of us. Maslow's need of hierarchy, mein, roti, kapra, makan, we are putting it at the base. Um, I think the necessity to be free is a very basic need, especially when you have the roti, kapra, makan given to you. We want to be free and your students are no different. They want to feel attention to you or not. They were choosing to pay attention to me or not. I, with my hallowed existence of a professor, felt it's my birthright that they have to pay attention to me. Of course, there is discipline, it's required. All of that is important. The fact of the matter But you plant a thought in somebody's mind. Isn't education that? You plant a thought. Well, Christopher Nolan's in Inception is a piece of genius, is a work of a genius. Why? Because he says that it's not just you planting a thought. I will plant the thought in such That's autonomy. I think it's an opportunity for us to go back to the basics and start thinking, how do we make people listen to us? How do we make people hear us, understand us, learn from us? Well, you cannot teach people. You'll have to help them learn. You know about that. See, there's a significant problem. Plus, we like to have smart students. Why? It's easier. If you have intelligent students, it's easier to teach them. It's also more joy. The definition of smart and not smart itself is very suspicious. The word smart and not smart possibly hailed from early IQ tests. I don't know if you, are, if you know or not. IQ... test started during or just before the first world war is muscles are not enough if you have a gun you can shoot people from a distance you need intelligence you needed to intel find smart people intelligent people and how do we do that you write a maths test and a language test that's how you started with iq tests 
And that became your GMAT test, became your CAT test. Every test there is easier for us. But you know what smartness is? This word is popular nowadays. It's symptomatic. You don't know who's smart. It's very hard to tell who's smart, who's not. A critical consideration, therefore, is perhaps this. I know it's a lot of... Writing over here, you can write, you can read it. The smart kids, the not so smart kids, the kids who don't study discipline issues, A student, B student, C plus student, C student, D student. We've always broken them down. Why? Because it's easier. I don't blame educators entirely for this. When you have to teach 60 students, the possible It is really hard to do it when you have possibility of moving from a C to an A. But how do you spend that time? But you know what? In this online world, putting groups like this and buckets like this just will not work. You have technology and with technology, you have to make it learner centric. I mean, you can, it's not about that. My session is to remind us, we cannot put people into brackets. Think about this, right? Well, this webinar has people from different walks of life. You have different faculties with different interest areas. If you think about it, my talk is a bit of many things, right? It's, it's, it's much like a, Uh, and a lots and lots of information from the WhatsApp University, of course. The different schools of thinking involved over here. But you know what's important is I need to somehow find a common ground which will cut across all of you. And that's how, and I possibly could have done it differently. That's why a webinar in a classroom is not the same. This session has got so many varieties. In your classroom, in your 60 students, we feel it's an MBA HR class, so they're all similar. No, they're not. We feel it's a chemistry class, so they're all similar. No, they're not. We possibly could not. Now maybe we can. So how do we learn? Well, I sorry about that. I always learn from the mistakes of others who took my advice. So maybe that's one reminder that don't take my advice or don't take me seriously. But we need to find out how do we learn? How do you learn? I think it's important learning how to learn. Some of you might have taken it. Those of you who have not, I encourage you to take those sessions. Irrespective of what you are teaching, irrespective of how successful you have been as a teacher, it's time that we go and learn ourselves. We should start with there. Why do people learn? How do they learn? quick autonomy, our thinking in our mind that we need to choose to learn, but be careful, of, careful about the paradox. There's a paradox of choices. Maybe time for a, a different session for those of you who want to take this offline, or you can just Wikipedia, it's a fantastic article of that. 
plenty of choices, too many choices. It's also not a good idea. One of the, we were discussing what makes Amazon so immensely successful. And we discussed, we spoke about availability, we spoke about enormous choices, we spoke about price advantages, delivery, Amazon Prime. This is none of that. The real reason why Amazon is so successful is not choices. Choices can confuse you. Simplicity. Big question to ask yourself. I've been asking myself for everything that I've been teaching. I've been teaching literally all my life. I'm very interesting. Am I? I chanced upon this. Somebody sent it to me and I laughed. Are we interesting? Is our session interesting? Another thing that's important after speaking to my students, the last month and a half I've been talking to my students. I've been also calling my students up, people I have taught 15, 18, 20 years back. I'm organizing Zoom sessions. I've been having You know, when Ishita was introducing me, I have done hundreds of workshops, I have 40,000 students, I have gone to this place, I have done this, I'm a director here, that, blah, blah, blah. It's quite possible for me to believe that I have tons of knowledge. I'm part of something called the Data Science Foundation, a premier data science network, one of its kind in the world. I'm a data scientist. Since I am one of the heads of that foundation, so I must be a great data scientist. That's not true at all. That I have an intern working in our data science foundation who I think is a far superior data scientist than I can ever be. We need to understand that we are not fortune tellers. We do not know what's going to happen in the future. We do not know. We have to stop pretending to know everything that's going to happen. And then came this meme. One of the many businesses I've been part of is a recruitment business. I ran recruit, I'm, I'm an interviewer. And it's a popular question. We ask students, what are you going to do five years from now? I'm sure tons of people ask people in 2015, what are you going to do five years from now? Stay at home for three months. Absurd, isn't it? A life per se is absurd. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We should stop pretending to know that. upset and i would say if you read you can make things in your mind your creativity will improve we learn so many things it took him a lot of courage to one day tell me he said dad i do read but i don't read a lot i just watch videos I said, but it's not the same as reading he said but it's just so much more convenient i can watch videos and tons of them and then i start thinking Am I, am I not trying to push him to be like me when I was 15, 16? Jim Flynn, somebody I greatly admire in the world of psychometrics, and I have had the great fortune of spending some time with him. 
his latest research was about how every generation is getting smarter than the earlier generation. And every old guy feels that he was smarter. But it's not true. All of us, if we look deeply inwards, we know that our kids are possibly smarter than we were at that age. We believe that all these devices, all this internet and technology is going to ruin the child and not just the child, the, the pet too. On the contrary, maybe it is time that we learn from them. And some of you I know do that. You learn from your children. I made a list of stuff that I found I think would be useful. I'll be very happy to share this list with you, Dr. Tiwari. And you can share it with those who want to know more about this. I do not know all sure, of them. I do not know all of these things. I do know some of them. I am I, one of my businesses is in digital media, so I have to stay abreast with technology. Um, I have been using Canvas, for example, Canva, for example, a very long time. I've used Survey Monkeys and Type Forms. I've used Squeeze Makers. I've used a Padlet. I've used many of these tools, but I've not used many of them as well. I'll be happy to share this. And those of you who truly want to learn technology, here's a list and there could be more. I would recommend that you spend time with your students or your children and learn together along with them. Most likely they'll learn it faster than you and then they can teach you. That's what I'm doing. Shangu Mitra, who is also here in this call, um, but she's not my secretary, actually, you guys pointed out. She's my, uh, my colleague and my assistant. She's been working with me for eight years. I learned so much from her. She started a career with me. She's an HR specialist who eventually became a digital media specialist. And now she is the tech stroke people expert in our group. And I learn every day from her. Along with teaching me and my partners, she also manages a little child. So kids nowadays, when she's a lot younger than me, not only are smarter, they can manage time better. Knowing tech is not enough. We have to know it properly. If we use it properly. I found this meme to be hilarious. So some usual stuff and some unusual stuff. Camera, we spoke about it earlier. Requesting students to keep their videos on or requesting them to keep their videos, switch it on for every 10, 15 minutes is one good way of keeping them connected to you. Um, some ground rules of engagement you should establish right at the beginning uh, and let them make those rules so that they can own those rules and observe and follow those rules. It's impossible for you to make them follow uh, unless they want to follow. Them. Give them more responsibilities. Start treating them in the way you would want to be treated. Discipline is crucial, but can only come from within. You cannot impose discipline. You could never do it. Even when you were teaching, my son is a musician. He plays the guitar. I remember many years back in a parent teachers meeting in his school, his maths teacher, very nice lady. And she knew I had a lot of, I love maths as well. And we would end up talking and in the parent teachers meeting, she says, you know what, Mr. Majinder Aditya, um, was not paying attention. I was teaching board mass in the class. And when I was teaching board mass, you know what he was doing? So I asked her, what was he, what was he doing? He says, his, he was holding his imaginary guitar in his hand and he was playing it. I said, oh. So my son used to take his guitar to school all his life. He still does. So I said, what did you do? He says, I took the guitar, which was kept in front of him in the classroom and kept it outside the classroom to bring him back in my class. I didn't say anything to her that day. But between you and me, do you think my son then paid attention to board mass? Maybe his eyes were open, but his mind was with his guitar, which was kept in the hallway, and he was thinking somebody should not steal it. Discipline has to come from within. You cannot force it. Now in the world of online education, there's no way you can enforce it, discipline. Smaller class durations work better. Smaller classrooms work better. Now, neither of those two, you may be able to choose all the time. It's, it's an institutional decision, but it could, you need to think about this. 
internet is a friend and not the demon here. All your students will now use the internet all the time. They always did it. Now they're going to do it even more so. Previously, you would tell them, don't use your phone during the class. Now they are using their phone to attend your class, most likely. And the internet is on. You embrace the internet quickly and change your teaching standard and style so that you can get them to use the internet. That's how you're going to keep them connected to you. You cannot tell them, don't use the internet. That's not going to, that's not going to work. It's a cruel meme. I'm sorry if this offends somebody, but I found it immensely funny. There are better ways to gauge learning than just taking exams. I don't know about you. I, for one, and I suspect many of you, had an exam phobia. I think exams are one of the most inefficient ways of actually gauging people's learning. Right. But then, exams are part of life. It will continue to be so. Don't depend on it. There could be better ways to check whether people are learning or not. I'm coming, I'm in the last section of my class. I'm running a little late. I'm going to go a little faster. We spoke about COVID-19 right at the beginning and we spoke about how scared we should be with 170 million job losses, 50 million in the last two weeks, etc. So I said, let's get scared. And I said, let's get scared. And then I'm now saying into what? Be paralyzed with fear. Give up, crawl in a corner, wait for the inevitable or for things to automatically get better. No. I refuse to be cowered down. I refuse to be paralyzed. And I refuse to be helpless. And I refuse to wait. I accept things are bad, things won't be easy, things will not be like before. But I know things will be better and can only be better. I have now come to embrace and realize that online education is here to stay. Even if classrooms open, I'm not letting it go anymore. I would like to be finally the person that I should have been before and embrace technology, innovation in my teaching and become the blended learning specialist no, I don't want to say that. I think online is going to be a crucial part of everything that I do from now onwards, even when classrooms start. This um, is how crisis is written in Chinese. It's ironical that you have to use a Chinese script. When you break the two syllables, that's what it looks like, danger and opportunity. This COVID scenario has created this opportunity for us in this danger, in this dangerous time. Some force change that will become apparent now is we need to adapt, we need to survive quickly, and we need to have entrepreneurial thinking. In the entrepreneurial way, it's the new normal. You can always argue whether the new norm, the old normal was at all relevant. Maybe the new normal is going to be more relevant. We need to rethink everything in our lives. As we are now seeing, 130 crore people, 40,000 ventilators. There is something wrong with everything that we have done. Let's fix it now. So I've decided to adapt, learn, change, embrace technology, understand my learners better, to realize the immense responsibility I carry on my shoulders and strive to work harder, smarter. I agree, working from home is not easy. I find this hilarious. But we really must stop cribbing now. This is an opportunity and not a curse. This is, um, <clears throat> may not be true. I think I would like to go back to work. I'm missing my colleagues. I'm missing my professors in various colleges that I've had the opportunity of meeting. I'm missing my students. I want to go back to work. I will have to wear full pants, true. Possibly wearing shorts right now and you will never know. So the important point over here is that we need to make plans. We need to make plans of how we're going to get better, how we're going to improve in our journey to become more effective online educators. But there's this famous expression that I use in every webinar of mine. This is a song by John Lennon. Somebody profound said that. The life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. If that is the case, then plans are worthless and planning is everything. 
This is what Eisenhower and Winston Churchill said during Second World War. So it's not the plans that matter, it's the state of planning. So you can make plans of how you're going to improve, but what's important is that you accept that we need to change ourselves, we need to learn these things, we need to stay in that state of continuous planning and executing. We have a massive responsibility now. We need clarity, focus, big picture, little things, tech and people skills. The most important is the last part. A significant part of our job is to keep hoping, and is to keep encouraging. Many educators forget that. If you're not doing that last bit, the rest don't matter. I know I'm going a little too quickly, I'm mindful of the time, so sorry. This is, I think, a little synopsis of the future. What do you think employer students will seek in the future? You should start thinking. What would tomorrow's employers want out of your students? And how can you make use of your time now? I am suggesting go and take a learn how to be a more effective teacher course, like learning how to learn, go take these courses, relearn your subjects in the modern parlance, etc., etc. Learn technology. Should we understand economics a little bit more? It is so important. Even the economics professors need to go and learn economics differently. Maybe, uh, maybe go and learn what Richard Taylor has been talking about through behavioral economics. I think all of us need to spend time in trying and understanding human behavior. Well, that's something that I've spent my entire life trying to understand and I still am not sure whether I truly understand it or not. But I think it's the most cr crucial aspect of all. I think it's time for us to be a little more honest about ourselves. We need to know ourselves better. We need to figure out how to become stronger. And with that, we can possibly write our own song. Mary Kay, the famous cosmetic specialist, had this famous expression. Most people live and die with their music still unplayed. They never dare to try. You have an opportunity today. I have an opportunity today to become better in what we love doing, teaching. It's an opportunity given to us. Many of us don't get opportunities to improve and opportunity improve kare. And as we stare at the impending doom while we are trying to land our plane, I hereby finish my session. I said 20 minutes before time, I am two minutes, three minutes late. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. An absolute pleasure, a great honor to talk in front of you. Um, I hope I did not speak things which upset any of you and if I did, please pardon me. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for such a wonderful and terrific tra training session. Really, sir, we will be blessed. And definitely to keep the motivation on the list you provided, which you have shared in this platform, help us in all to keep the momentum on. It was a really fruitful and amazing time for us to learn so many innovative ideas, which we definitely going to implement in our e-teaching strategy. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Tiwari. I hope you all can. I hope you all can learn a few things and take out a lot of good out of this session. And your experiences can act as a learning curve for all of us. And I'm sure I am taking a load of things from this interaction. And sir, your style of delivery was impeccable. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out time for this session and grooming the young minds present here and sharing your experiences with the rest. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to uh, now, I would like to request. Thank you so much, ma'am. For the successful completion of today's session, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to our honorable guest, Mr. Kausab Mazumdar, sir. I would also like to thank our chief patron, Mrs. Alka Das Gupta, ma'am, chairperson, BBD Group of Education, the patrons, Professor Dr. Bhavesh Kumar Chauhan, sir, director, BBD and ITM Lucknow. Professor Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Director, Dr. ADGITM, New Delhi. The Advisory Committee, which includes Mr. Vinay Kumar Yadav, sir. Ms. Swati Khanna, ma'am. Shita, we can't hear you.
Assisting ma'am, I am Agar ma'am, I am Mr. Inkar first year, and Mr. Arjun Agrahari, student MBA first year, for assisting us throughout the program. This session has been an enriching experience for all the participants, and I thank you all for making it possible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ishita. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the participants. Dr. Shivangi, shall we uh, like we can end the session? Yes, ma'am. We can. Thank you so much, sir, thank for you. joining us. Thank you so thank much, you. sir. Thank you. We are really blessed to have you. We are really blessed to have you, sir. If Thank anybody you. wants to get in touch with me, please share my. Um, I mean, I'm available on LinkedIn or Facebook and Instagram. Please, please don't hesitate to connect. And uh, if you if you agree with me, great. If you disagree with me, I would like to hear your views. If you have alternate, it's a journey that all of us would need to take together. Um, none of us, I think, are experts. I certainly am no expert, and it's it's something that I'm trying to figure out and learn. And I think it's something that we can all learn together. All of you have a wonderful, wonderful day ahead. Please stay safe. God bless all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, all the participants. We'll be sharing uh, with you all a link, uh, which will have certain questions, and that uh, that will be a quiz. So thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Back. Have a very nice day. Yeah. And Take care, everyone. And. Uh, yes, sir. Fine, fine. No, like fine. Dr. Shivangi. No, no, no. So fine. Dr. Shivangi and Professor Priyanka, please share poll results with uh, Dr. Kosta Majumdar, sir. You know, later, later on. Because yes. he was sure, requesting sure, for sure, the poll will. results. Okay, 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 sure. sure, sir. Sure, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, shall we wind it with all your per uh, permission? Please wind up, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for good. Thank show. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Vivianshu, kindly. Uh, in the meeting yes i'm just taking the uh, screenshots of uh, the poll okay sure sure go ahead go ahead take your time please okay, thank you. i think thank you ma'am we had a really fruitful session of day 1